Welcome to the Saturday morning session of Extraordinary Technology 2010. I'm Michael Riversong. Our first speaker, Greg Volk, a man who has done a tremendous amount in a short time in terms of bringing out awareness of the broad diversity of research that's going on in these advanced technologies. He attended Stanford University. He's got degrees in electrical engineering and physics. He started uh, his career in optical character recognition, has done a lot of computer work since then. And he's been also a stockbroker, a mortgage broker, and a real estate agent. And he has been into this about three years ago. He got into it through looking at models of the electron. And he is the creator of the World Science Database, which is a significant resource that I'd like to see more people, including me, using a lot more often, because it's really, really good. Let's welcome Greg Volk. At all. Okay. Oh, the majority here like okay. Because I, I tailored this talk to not have much math in it, so I'm sorry to disappoint you. Because <laughs> I wanted to make it accessible to everybody and also uh, a couple of goals. Number one, um, I, want, I don't want to get bogged down on equations and all this kind of stuff. That's not the point. What I want to do is talk about some basic principles. And actually, what I have, instead of math, are toys. <laughs> so we're going to play with some toys today and hopefully learn some physics. In, in my view, if I can understand a physical principle by something really simple, really basic, that helps me get it. And sometimes I, I, I come up with an idea, and I'm trying to find a way to express it, and I'm seeing my kids playing. And with this toy, and I go, that's it, that's what I'm trying to figure out. And so hopefully that kind of light bulb experience, what I want to do today is have a lot of fun, talk about some real fundamental ideas and some fun and, and maybe innovative ways, and hopefully some light bulbs will go out, off for you as well. Uh, let me get my, I got all this hardware here. There we go, okay. Uh, there we go. So he post, he's already told you a little bit about myself. I went to Stanford in electrical engineering and physics. Uh, I've been a music arranger, he didn't mention that. I've been a landlord, and I'm not anymore, which is the best day of my life. <laughs> I'm also a Christian, and I'm a young earth creationist, so just to let you know, I'm not going to be talking about that today, but uh, there's a whole lot of amazing evidence supporting that viewpoint, and if I had a few hours, I'd love to talk about that too, but not today. Anyway, this is my family. Actually, my wife took the picture. That's my mom and my four kids and me, so just so you know. That's a big part of my life, and I, you know, as I mentioned before, when I learn new ideas, new ideas come to me, I have to share them with somebody, and so my kids are the ones that get the brunt of it. That, my young son, Tommy, he's the electrical engineer. He, we've been going through a little uh, 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 Radio Shack kit. He is just a whiz, electronics whiz, so I'm going to put him to work building uh, new energy machines one of these days. So uh, here's some of the, t the goals of this talk. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I really want to get uh, above all else is that toroids and vortexes are a fundamental um, attribute of nature. They're everywhere, they're, you can't get away from them, and they have some, there are consequences associated with that, and those consequences carry to all levels, to, to, the, to the microscopic level that we live at in, today, to the macroscopic level of the, of the universe itself, and, and to the microscopic level of atoms, which is my, my fundamental interest. I'm interested in tons of things, but I, I'm really interested in, in what is the structure like. So I'm not going to talk about a particular model necessarily, but about ideas behind models that must necessarily follow. And there's no question in my mind that the toruses and vortices are fundamental, and I hopefully will get that uh, idea across today. And that because that's true, because of this knowledge of these ideas, uh, it is possible to understand uh, what the atom is like, how quantum mechanics really works, why are there quanta at all? These kinds of questions uh, have answers, and hopefully we'll get to some of those today. I want to define energy, another word that we use a lot is ether, mass, zero point. I want to try to give precise definitions. One of the things that I have noticed uh, in our culture, as just independent uh, researchers and scientists, is a tendency to use these words but you mean, when you say energy or, or ether, and you say it, you don't mean the same things. 
And so, and what I mean is different than what you mean. We need to get better as a community at defining what these terms mean. I'm going to give you the definitions I think make sense. You can say, well, I don't think that's a good definition. That's okay. But the point is we're working towards that so that we can have something common and something uh, to talk about that's meaningful. I'm going to give you some definitions of these words that are not what, not what we talk about uh, in, in, in conventional science at all. And uh, hopefully they'll resonate with you. Uh, that's a word we want to use a lot in this talk. Uh, I want to talk about the idea of circuits. Because, because there are toruses, because there are circuits, there must be quanta. There must be, th that's where the quantum comes from, is the, is the existence of circuits. And we'll talk about why that's so and how that relates to something called topology. Topology is a fancy word for how do knots get tied and how, how do things relate to each other as groups, that kind of thing. And that's an important topic. It has, it's, it's a mathematical topic, but it's also an abstract topic and something that we should become familiar with if we want to describe some of these occurrences that we're, no, you know, that we're observing in, in, our, in our research. So I'd like to try to encourage the use of that word. Uh, I'm going to introduce toroidal coordinates, and there will be a little bit of math, but I'm going to go over it fairly quickly because I don't want to get bogged down in that. Um, and then we're going to talk about knots. There's, there's certain, a certain class of knots called toroid knots, and what those mean and how we get those. There are also other kinds of knots. We'll talk a little bit about that. Why they're important, uh, in my opinion, I'm just going to spill the beans a little bit. Uh, I believe that fundamental particles, each of them have their, their attributes that we know in, um, in physics today as charm, strangeness. <laughs> have you heard these terms before? It's like they have mathematical meaning, but do they have physical meaning? I don't, in the, not much, but I believe it's possible to, if we, if, we, if we understand knots and topology and how things are flowing in and out amongst themselves, we can actually put some physical meaning to what those terms mean. Uh, so I'd like to challenge, I'm not saying I've solved that problem, but I'm, I'm saying I, I believe that those problems are soluble. We can actually make sense out of what those things really mean physically in terms of physical geometric models. I'm going to talk a, a lot about something called the strobe effect, which we've seen a lot today. So. Uh, these are all kind of related to the idea of vortexes and vortices, so that's where we'll be going. That's, that's the thing that kind of gets this all centered. I'm, the, actually, the first half of the talk is going to be a lot of preamble, which I said, well, I've got to include that, I've got to include that. <laughs> so uh, so uh, the, the last half of the talk will be actually talking about the toroid form and the toroidal coordinates. Um, and uh, a lot of, in, uh, just about every slide in this presentation could be about an hour's presentation by itself. So I'm going to be cramming a lot of information uh, and not a lot of development on any one of them, which I would like to have. So if there's questions afterwards, you know, I'd be happy to talk to people about what, what the heck is he talking about. But uh, anyway, let's go on. I'm going to just start with a, a little bit of my own history. As um, Mike said earlier, I got started about three years ago, and it was, a, I think, a, kind of a neat story. I, uh, I found out about a guy who takes trips every summer to South Dakota. And, uh, and it's in a place, you, what you have to do is you have to go to the middle of nowhere and then you have to drive 40 miles away from that. <laughs> and that's where, that's where this is. And he takes people out to dig for dinosaur bones. And it's on, it's on uh, someone's property, it's right next to an Indian reservation. I mean, it is in the middle of nowhere. And it's really interesting topology. You could be, you could be walking along a plain, this grassy plain, and all of a sudden, whoop, there's a 300 foot drop. It's like, whoa, where'd that come from? And along the side of this cliff, then we have layers of interesting stuff that you can dig in and find. I, I got a big old, uh, it was called an Edmontosaurus, big old leg bone about this big that I dug out myself. It took me a week to do it, uh, which was fun. I, th nothing to do with the talk, but a fun story. Uh, Russ McGlenn uh, was the guy that, that put that on. Uh, he's, he's one of my mentors. He wrote a little book, and I just said, well, you know, I'll read his book. I didn't know anything about it. And it was about the, the new model of the atom based on classical science. And in that book, and it's hard to get a copy of this book, you can't get it on, on uh, Amazon, but great little book. Uh, he talks about the, the uh, Bergman and Lucas, if you've heard those names before, they have an organization called Common Sense Science, model of the electron. And it's a spinning, just a little ring that spins, and it, and it has, and the charge is moving at speed c, and it has angular momentum h, and all of these things, I'm going, wow, I, for the first time in my life, I, I could see a physical model for this thing instead of just, you know, assuming all of these properties that it somehow magically had. It actually has these properties for a reason, and, and you can figure it out. That just amazed me. I mean, I was just, I, I don't know if anybody's ever just got, read something and just gotten on fire, but that was my experience with that book. And uh, 
that led me to get to know these two people. Uh, I got, I've gotten to know David Bergman and Bill Lucas very well. They're two of my heroes. Um, I think they've done more in science than anybody in the last 15 years. Uh, that's just my own opinion. Uh, they are geniuses and they've done some tremendous work. And uh, here's, here's some of the things. Here's uh, just a couple of uh, pictures from their website, which is Common Sense Science. Uh, it's a toroid-based uh, uh, electron with these fiber loops that, that, that move helically around there. That's, they call them charge fiber loops around a torus form. That's, that's kind of the, the basic model of what they feel is the electron is like. Um, and, this, and then if they want to talk about something like the hydrogen molecule, what they, they, uh, they are talking about a two protons and two electrons in a ring like this, because hydrogen is generally not monatomic, it's, it's, it's diatomic, and this is the structure. They feel it works. They've done, what, what they've done that other people don't do is they've actually done the math on this, and it, and it all, all the properties that we know that the molecule has, they're deriving from these, these things. And, and, you know, you have to say, wow, you, you have to take that seriously. What's interesting about their model is the proton is smaller and the electron is bigger. That may be surprising because you think, well, big things weigh more and small things weigh less. Uh, but, but that's the first lesson we got to figure out is uh, we all know what, con what angular momentum is, right? You, you've seen that when you see a figure skater and they bring their, ma their, their mass in, they spin faster, right? Well, that's basically the idea. Angular momentum is, uh, in their model, uh, charge C is spinning at, at, at speed C, uh, the, the, the each charge element, and, and then the, um, the, uh, the, the angular momentum is that number times the radius times the frequency. So that means as the radius decreases, the frequency increases. So what I like to think of it is, I like to think of the electron as a big old Ferris wheel, like uh, weighing as much as a piece of string, <laughs> and the proton is this little tiny ring, and it's, it's, they're, they're moving at the same speed, but this weighs as much as a car, 1,800 times more, okay? They have the same angular momentum, but a different, the proton is more massive. Uh, so interesting way to, to think of it. So uh, that got me to really thinking, really looking at some of the things that they can do. Here are some of the accomplishments. They've predicted the known properties of the electron and proton. They've predicted the properties of the neutron. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And, and hydrogen and some other higher molecules. They're also developing, and I'm working with them, to develop a program to, to test different models. So if people come up with physical models, and we want to see, well, how stable is this model? How does it work? Does it, does it, you know, does it work? Does it resonate? And, and we, we, they would be able to do that. So they're, they're working hard for several years on that program. Uh, they use known laws of physics, the laws of electrodynamic, to establish these stable finite structures. And they, they provide physical meaning for, for constants that we know, the electric charge C, the speed, uh, electric charge E, speed C, and the uh, angular uh, Planck's constant H, angular momentum. It explains the wave particle duality. And what I mean by that is it's a wave because it has a frequency. How can it not have a frequency if it's, it, it, because it's a torus, because it's a, a closed cir circuit, it has a frequency associated with it. And that's a wave. That's what a wave is. Ultimately, that's what all waves are. It's just something that generates frequencies. And yet it's a particle. So, so there we have that duality explained and understood. They understand mass and energy as a duality. Mass is the resistance to motion. It's not a property of how much stuff you got. And when you understand it in that way, then a lot of things start to just disappear, a lot of, a lot of anomalies and, and problems in physics. Takes into account coupling or mutual energies, which is a big deal. That, that is a, a, a foundational thing to understand. I think, did my mic just go? And, uh, and understanding how to connect electricity and magnetism with thermodynamics. That thing right there, the idea of coupling and mutual energies, we'll come back to that. It supports a vortex-based understanding of physics, which is what we're going to be talking about. Just how, why is the vortex so important and so essential? And it's electrodynamic. They, uh, Dr. Lucas actually has come up with an electrodynamic model of gravity. It's based on the fact that there is a dipole nature to the atom itself because we have the proton on the inside and the electron on the outside. And, and if we have two atoms with that same structure, or excuse me, yeah, two, two atoms, the proton and proton are going to repel, the electron and electron are going to repel, but the proton and electron are going to attract and they don't quite cancel. There's a, a net attraction. And what I love about these guys is they're doing the math and they're showing, here it is. And it's like one part in 10 to the 20th, 
And, uh, and in my opinion, that's the best model. He just wrote a paper that came out about a year and a half ago, and uh, it's the best model of gravity I've seen. So it, I think most people in this room are, are okay with the idea that gravity is ultimately electromagnetic in character. Everybody, anybody have a hard objection? To, okay, good. Everybody likes that idea. Oh, uh, CSS is common sense science. Let me, okay. Sorry, I said that. Uh, there we go, common sense science. So sorry about that. And there's their website, commonsensescience.org. Pretty easy to remember. Another way to get to it, this is the way I get to everything, by the way. I go to the World Science Database, worldsci.org, and I look up their name, and, their, and I can get to their website from there. So I don't remember. I don't have to remember everybody's website. I just go there. Uh, so anyway. That's my background. The thing that really got me excited, and this is a couple, you know, once I kind of got into it a little bit, was this model of the neutron. And this is pretty simple looking. In 2001, David Bergman wrote a paper called Notions of the Neutron. And uh, he has been working on this problem ever since. This is a first order attempt. Basically, what, what he came up with was that the, the, these rings are not fixed. They actually expand and collapse, OK? And now some people are going to have a problem, and I'll get to this. Well, how can they expand and collapse if they're always the same mass? Well, <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh, but th this, except this idea, the proton is expanding outward in attraction to the electron. The electron is expand, uh, comp contracting inward, and they're going to reach a, a stable equilibrium. And there's something called magnetic moment, a very important concept. Uh, the electron, uh, that the neutron has a, what's called an anomalous magnetic moment. It's about five times the magnetic moment of the free proton. And nobody's been able to explain that. This model explains it, because what we have is a, a, the electron magnetic moment, because it has a greater area, has a greater magnetic moment, and it dominates over the, it more than cancels the proton electric, uh, the magnetic moment. They're able to calculate that, just exactly uh, derive that number uh, from the model. And it's, it's kind of a feedback mechanism. You, you, you can't just get an x equals sort of thing. You have to do it, a recursive iteration to be able to get the, the deal. I've worked on this problem. It's fascinating. Um, but uh, well, the other thing is there's a, there's a guy, a Nobel Prize laureate, Douglas Hofstetter, who did some research uh, in the 50s that, that showed that the, the distribution of charge of the neutron and the proton is not, is not all pointed at the center. There's actually a, a distribution curve that the closer to the center of the neutron is actually more positive and the further out is actually more negative, and this matches that perfectly. So there's two con confirming ideas of this model. So that got me really excited, but the thing that really, and this is the point I want to get to, <laughs> The thing that got me excited was I said, OK, we take the, the energy of the electron and we add it to the energy of the proton, we should get the energy of the neutron, right? Wrong. Anybody have a guess as to what's missing? OK. See, the way David Bergman does it, that's all right, no problem. The way David Bergman does it is he calculates the inductance of each of these, because he thinks of them as like little coils. OK, and he calculates the inductance, and then from there he gets the energy. There's something when you have two coils side by side, there's something called mutual inductance. OK? And he says, well, you have to, you have to subtract the mutual inductance energy. OK? So in other words, I said, David, now let me see if I get this straight. You're saying that the whole is less than the sum of the parts. Is that what you're saying? Yep. That's right. <laughs> now, I don't know if you think, if this isn't a bulb event for you, it was major, massive, huge, big time light bulb for me. It's like, oh my goodness, there's something really important in that. Okay, so there's my question. Can the whole be less than the sum of the parts? Well then, and obviously it is. Okay, so, some, so where is the energy? You get the question, where is the energy? Yes, go ahead. Oh, all right, so where is the energy? That's the question. If, if the whole is less than the sum of the parts or greater than the sum of the parts, the energy can't be located at the parts, can it? Is, it? is it at A or is it at B or is it somewhere else? It's somewhere else, right? So the mutual energy, what, what this is saying, it's saying a lot of things, but one of the things it's saying is saying that the energy is not localized to the particle. It's got to be somewhere else. It's got to be actually distributed through space, okay? Does that make some sense? So there's the first thing, but also think about it this way. Each of those components, in other words, the electron itself is also composed of parts, and it's com those parts are composed of parts, and each of those parts are interacting. So all energy, in a sense, is ultimately mutual energy. Are you following me? 
So, so everything is based on its interaction with something else, and those interactions are taking place at a distance. There is, there's the energy itself resides somewhere other than with the particle. There's no such thing as a big blob. There's, a, there's, there's structure to all of this stuff. So that's important. Where is the energy? It's located in space. But also, the idea of mutual energies is central to my understanding. This is what got me going on my theory of entropy. Okay, what is entropy? And we're going, to talk about, we're going to talk about that. Does it relate to entropy or does it relate to temperature? The answer is screamingly yes. In fact, I'll just go ahead and give you my definition of entropy. And it's not the one that you find in the textbooks, but it fits. All of the definitions, Boltzmann's. By the way, anybody ever, has anybody read all of Boltzmann's papers? <laughs> I didn't think so. 500 pages. I've read it. And uh, I'm telling you, and it's great, it's wonderful stuff, but he does not get in, this isn't where he goes. All of his ideas are based on the idea that, that these, there's these little blobs of billiard balls of mass and that they're interacting with each other. But what he doesn't answer and what nobody seems to be interested in is how did the mass become a billiard ball in the first place? In other words, that billiard ball is really composed of a bunch of other little things which are composed of other little things. And there's, there's got to be a relationship be between how all that works. So thermodynamics and all entropy-related things are based on statistics. In order to do that, we have to have finite things of something to begin with. And in order to have that, we have to have circuits. Okay? Is this, this is all connecting. So this is how entropy is connected. My definition of entropy is this. It's the ratio of the whole to the sum of the parts modified in the case of physics by Boltzmann's constant. I can take those definitions and from that I can derive all the laws of thermodynamics. And I've done it. If you're interested, I'll, I'll be happy to send you my paper. So anyway, that's, that's where coupling and entanglement and all these ideas are related. And the idea of, if you want to call it an ether, energy being reside, resident in space. And here we go, one of my heroes, hopefully one of yours, Michael Faraday. If, by the way, I've got this quote from Stephen Rado, and I tried to find the original source in Michael Faraday's work, and I haven't found it. So if anybody can do that, I'd be grateful. So uh, this is uh, Stephen Rado's rendition of what Michael Faraday said, but it's great. Space is not nothing or the mere location of bodies and forces, but a medium capable of supporting the strains of electric and magnetic forces. Get this. The energies of the world are not localized in the particles from which these forces arose, but rather are to be found in the space surrounding them. Does anybody have a problem with this in this group? <laughs> okay, I didn't think anybody would. But you know what? This, this is 100% this is contrary to what conventional science is teaching today and has been teaching for over 100 years. Big problem. Uh, this is another one of my heroes, hopefully one of yours. Guess what he said? This is probably the most significant scientific work written in the 19th century, his treatise on electricity and magnetism. Anybody want to debate with me on that one? Here's what he said. It's mainly with the hope of making Faraday's ideas, what we just talked about, of the basis of a mathematical method that I have undertaken this treatise. In other words, what was his motivation for writing probably the most important paper in science for 100 years? Because to, to, to figure out how it is that energy is resident in space. How, how can we quantify that? And that's why we need fields, and why we need theories like that. Now, his theory isn't perfect. He died young, <laughs> but it's pretty darn good. All right, there's, there's one thing, there's a couple of basic things we need to talk about. We'll do some toys here. Uh, if, if we're going to be using charged matter, by the way, I need to just, just say this. There, uh, let me ask a question. How many people believe that there are two kinds of charge? You do? OK, one, two. OK, all right. OK, I'm going to, uh, that was a trick question. And I, the point where I'm going with this is there are what, there's only one kind of charge, only one kind of matter, but there are two kinds of motion. OK, there's right-handed and there's left-handed motion. And, and uh, what, I'm, what I'm, don't worry, we're, we're still friends. <laughs> cool, cool. So that's what I want to clarify. Uh, in, in common, regular, you know, everyday thinking, uh, mainstream thinking, there are two kinds of charge. There are like two kinds of billiard balls. Well, no, there's not. There's just two kinds of motion. So we can have this right-handed and left-handed. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And they're, they're, they're made of the same stuff. And as long as they're made of the same stuff, fundamentally the same stuff, what does the laws of uh, electromagnetism tell us? Repel. Like elements of matter, Repel. This is contrary to what we think. We think mass attracts, and so we're going to get all these black holes. 
Well, that's not really the way it works. Like elements of matter repel. So what's the source of attraction? That's the, that's the question we have to figure out. Okay, and when we figure that out, we can figure out stuff like gravity. Okay, we gotta, but we gotta start with this basis. Like things repel, that's a new one. Hopefully a light bulb issue for some people. Okay, the attraction, the answer is it comes from motion. And there are, there are two analogous, I like to, th I, in my mind, Ampere's law and Bernoulli's principle are one and the same. One is an electrical application, the other is a mechanical application. Okay, here's, how, here's the, way to, the easiest way I can think of it. Think of uh, water flowing through a stream, or let's say a pipe, and then the pipe narrows. What happens? The velocity increases. What happens if we increase the velocity? The pressure decreases or the channel narrows, right? One of the two things. Okay, or like for example, if, if you were to you know, push more water through, through a stream, it, the, the channel actually narrows. And one way to think of that is, is watch the water falling out of your tap in your sink. The, the water column at the top of the, the column is, is wider than it is at the bottom. It also twists a little bit. And there's but, uh, but think about that. The reason is because the same amount, if you, take, if you take consecutive cross sections of that flow, the same amount of matter has to pass through this cross section as is passing through this one. Otherwise, where's the matter coming from? It's conservation of matter that, that demands that when the, the velocity increases, the, 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 the cross section decreases, or when the cross section, you know, whatever way you want to go, cross section and the, and the velocity are intimately connected. And it isn't that one causes the other, it's that the two things are inseparable. You, have to, you can't have one without the other. Otherwise, you've, you're creating matter. And where is it coming from? It makes no sense. So that's the source of attraction. If you think about it, it it's also a group action. In other words, how, how does this element over here, that's, this is my cross section, how does this element over here know to attract this one over here? <laughs> they're not in the same place. They know that they're supposed to come together. It's a group activity, it's constriction. All these things working together as a whole to, to make that attraction happen. And uh, anyway, so you see it in the narrowing of a string, you see it in the parallel currents of Ampere's law, two parallel currents want to bind together. Why? Because the same, you increase the flow of that current and it has to uh, adjust to a smaller cross section. That's basically what it's doing. That's why it does what it does. By the way, uh, the little block of wood there is to remind me to show you this. <laughs> this is fun. There was a, 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 Mike said earlier that we had a, we had a conference. It's the uh, Natural Philosophy Alliance, and I've uh, I work, been working with that organization now for a couple of years. And we had our conference last week. And one of the people that was there uh, was Ed Sakota. And he had this cool demonstration on Bernoulli's principle, and he's claiming, and he's right, that Bernoulli's principle, as it's commonly taught in, in college physics, is not correct. It's basically what they're saying is it's just the motion that's causing it. And in fact, it's not just the motion. It's the expansion of the cross-section of the motion. In other words, if, if, if you, and I should have done this, if you just blow water, if you just blow air through a tube, okay, if, I, if this was paper tube, it would not, it would not collapse. Okay, but if I had the tube shaped like a horn, then the, then the cross section gets bigger, you get the collapse because the same amount of matter has to pass through that same area. You follow and it's wanting to go at the same velocity, it wants to constrict the cross section. Okay, that's the, tr that's the correct understanding, but this is, this is a fun little toy that he gave me. If I blow on this card, it's gonna go down, right? Anybody wanna see what happens when I blow on this card? Whoops, thanks a lot. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, come on, my little thing fell out. Worked perfectly when I showed it to Mike earlier. There we go, come on. Whoop, <clears throat> it fell to the side. Okay, the point is, my mic came off. Okay. Has that been off for a long time or just came off? Okay, thank you. Uh, the point is, it's the motion through this cross section. Okay, if you can think of the cross section as coming in or going out, either way it's spreading out, it's that channel changing, uh, cr cr changing the area that's causing the attraction. And that's an interesting way to look at Bernoulli's principle. So, so now let's, let's take, think about the model of the electron. As this thing is, if it increases motion, there's gonna be more constriction. Okay, so what's causing it to bind together is the constriction of the motion itself. It's, it has to be dynamic. In other words, if there were no motion, there would be no particles. 
Is everybody getting this? The particle only exists because it's moving. It has to move. And that's, that's, what, that's why we have something called zero-point energy. I'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, anyway, it's, it's the motion that's holding it together. And by the way, let me talk about one more thing while I'm on that subject. Uh, think of the motion as, think of an element of matter within that circuit, OK? The, the motion in this direction is causing constriction in all these directions. But we also have to have constriction in these directions or it's going to fly apart. Is everybody following me? So there has to also be motion orthogonal to the, to the direction of, of the motion. In other words, there has to be motion around the cross section. Is everybody following the logic here? And that's why there has to be a helicity. It's not as though we're just, it's just a neat idea that works. No, it's essential. And that's why when, when your sink comes, uh, water comes out of your sink or a waterfall, you see that little twirl at the bottom. It's like it, it's not able to constrict any further because water is incompressible. So it does the next best thing, causing motion in this direction so that, so that it doesn't have to compress. Is this making some sense? That's why it does that. OK, this is the, a fundamental principle uh, that is behind most of my work. Uh, i got to get a picture of good old Mach there. Got to love that beard. That's Ernst Mach. And you know what? Ernst Mach was a challenging guy. He, he and uh, Boltzmann didn't get along because Boltzmann was, all of his work was based on the existence of atoms and based on the kinetics of atoms. And of course, his work was brilliant. But Mach is saying, I don't believe atoms exist. <laughs> Seriously, he went to his grave believing atoms didn't exist. And you know what? He was right to believe that. You know why? Because he had no reason to believe it. But hopefully, if we understand what vortexes and what circuits are, we have a reason to believe it. It's, it's a balance of forces on finite objects because of the motion of those objects, which would otherwise fly apart without the motion. That's a reason to believe that there's particles. Because, th because particles, circuits have to be finite. There have to be finite globs of stuff, OK? But he had no reason for believing that. But he did have an amazing principle. He said, well, huh, I, had to, I had to quote Stephen Hawking. He says, local, physic law, local physical laws are determined by the large scale structure of the universe. I just included that just to show uh, I don't understand anything he says either. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I think what he's trying to say is everything that's happening way out there is influencing what we're doing here. OK? So I would make it, I like to keep it a lot simpler and say matter there influences motion here. OK? There's a direct linkage, OK, between what's going on over there. Otherwise, how do we account for where the energy is? How do we account for all this stuff? And that's, that's what Mach's principle, in essence, is saying. Another way to say it is motion, we determine whether something is moving at all with respect to matter, not with respect to space itself, which is the 19th century static ether idea where everything is, there's, there's this stationary frame that everything's moving with respect to, that's, there's no reason to believe that. And not observer, which is Einsteinian physics. Einstein, based on Einsteinian physics, this is absolutely true. And I've talked to several conventional scientists. The energy of a particle depends on how you look at it. Does that make sense to you? Maybe some of you did. It doesn't make sense to me. And, and so I understand, let's put it this way. If, if water is flowing down that stream, it's because the water is flowing with respect to the bank. That's how I know it's moving. If the bank weren't there, I wouldn't know it was moving. Okay? If, 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 the if wind is going through a windmill, turning that windmill, it doesn't matter how fast I run. The windmill is turning because the wind is moving with respect to the windmill. Right? It's not, it, my observation of it has no bearing on whether that thing's moving or not. Okay? And that's the point. Matter, motion is with respect to matter, not space, or observer. OK, here's a little Machian Gedanken experiment. Gedanken means thought, thought experiment. It's very simple. Imagine, here's my little element of matter. <laughs> so think just one little element. In other words, I take my part of my part of my part of my part, and I'm down to my infinitesimal thing, and I say, what is it moving? How do I know? I could put little, you know, little lines there beside it and say, now it's moving. But seriously, how do you know? You know with respect to what? Now, if, if, if with respect to space, how, you know, how do we measure that? How do we say, where, where's that frame? How do we determine that? If, if with, respect, with respect to observer, then it's arbitrary. If by matter, then all matter was, and this is, this is a key philosophical point that I really want to drive home. 
if all matter, if, if I'm moving with respect to other matter, then I need to know where that other matter is, but also that other matter must actually be there. In other words, they must be interacting right now, or how can I tell that it's moving? In other words, the billiard ball universe where this thing is here and this thing is here, and they know nothing about each other until they come into contact, is crazy. I have to have some sort of a mutual thing going on here, and I have to know what that is. So I need to know that this matter has to be present at this location in some sense, some way. I have to be able to track that to be able to satisfy Mach's principle. Does this make sense? So that's the, key, that's the key philosophical thing for me. I should have put a light bulb there. So can matter actually be present where it is not? This is foreign to Aristotle, foreign to almost all physicists today. No matter cannot be present where it is not. So it's a difficult question, and I'm going to give you two answers. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> okay? You have to be extremely careful about how you define things. Okay? So I'm going to try to do that now. It depends on our definition of matter. To exert influence elsewhere, matter must possess something that we call fields. In other words, for this element to influence this element right now, for me to be able to tell whether this thing is moving with respect to this, I have to have some accounting system to tell me what's going on with this one. And that, that accounting system is a field. We, ha we, have, to, we have to include that. We, when we talk about this element of matter, we have to also talk about its field. We can't separate the two. We have to have it. Okay? If an element's field is inseparable from it, permanently attached, and this is how Dr. Lucas talks about it, then it is actually present throughout all the space. In other words, this little element right here doesn't just exist right here. It actually exists everywhere. Now, it exerts most influence right here, but it, it, it exists in its entirety everywhere. That field is part of what it is. And so when this thing is interacting with this thing, they are interacting actually not just at where they are. They're interacting everywhere in space. Okay? And, that, and, and we can quantify that. We can put numbers to that. It's called Poynting's theorem. Okay? And hopefully I'll, I'll show that in a little bit. But in that sense, if we define matter in that way, then all matter actually is in contact with all other matter because the matter and the field are part of the same whole. Okay? So they are local contact forces. So Aristotle would be happy. I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> Whoops. Here, whoa, gee whiz. Okay, so I'm going to make some definitions here. I talked earlier about making some definitions. What is a field? Okay, this is my definition. The field is the influence that a localized element of matter, my guy here, exerts at other points. And I, can, I have two fields that I need to, to describe that. One is the electric charge field, which is the D field, sometimes called the auxiliary electric field, and the H field, which is the motion field. I need to keep track of where it is and how it's moving. Okay, then I can say what this thing over here is moving with respect to. Does that make sense? Energy density, then, is the interaction of an element's total field. Thank you. We saw it getting ready to go, so we... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Energy density, there's Poynting's equation. And by the way, some of you may say, well, where's the half? It's there. Actually, the half arises when we assume that the field that it's interacting with is its own field. And then, then the half comes into play. This is what I'm talking about. Interaction of everything else. In fact, everything itself. That's what this means, and then there is no half. We won't worry about the math. That's all right. This is what I would define as the ether. If you want a precise mathematical definition, what is the ether? That's mine. It's the energy density field, and it's going to be different depending on what we're talking about. In other words, if I'm talking about the ether for this particle, that's going to be different than the ether for, for the other particle. It's, 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 it, well, the, the it's the interaction of its field with everything else. So the ether for that particle is going to be the interaction of that particle's fields with the fields of everything else. Okay? So that's my definition of ether. What is energy? This, by the way, has dimensions of energy density. So the energy, then, is the integral sum over all the space of that energy density function. So the energy is not localized, but there is a finite amount of energy associated with that particle. And the way to get it is to integrate or sum up all the components through space. That's and that, and by the way, there were a lot of people thinking in these terms around the time of the 1900, around the time of Einstein. And a lot of that, I, those, I, and they're still around, but these are not popular ideas today, okay? But they're not new. I'm not making these up. But here is something else. Mass is, energy is resistance to motion. In other words, mass is, is not amount of stuff. Okay, so for example, the electron and the proton we talked about earlier. The electron, uh, let me just see if I can explain this quickly. Uh, 
the electron has a lot more uh, interaction going on within the elements of the, of, of the body of the, of the, excuse me, the proton. The proton has more stuff going on, more internal energy, if you will, because they're closer together. And the electron has less. So this external field that comes along is the same field, but it's going to influence this one, the proton, less than it influences the electron. Follow me? So the, another way of saying that is the, the proton has more, because it has more internal energy, it has more resistance to motion, more mass. Both of these elements have the same amount of stuff, charge, but they have different amounts of mass. Mass is resistance to motion. And, all, and this, this starts to explain a lot of things. When we go back to the neutron, when we understand it in that way, we can say, what is the resistance to motion of this thing? Well, it doesn't, the two, the two parts don't add up, okay, but the resistance to motion, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, wow. Sorry, this is going to be tough to get through all this. Okay, definition of mass, and uh, oh my goodness. Uh, entropy. I may skip this because I want to get to some other, well, no, I won't skip this because I want to talk, I want to give you a definition of zero-point energy. Okay, I talked to you earlier about the whole being, uh, the, the entropy being the ratio of the whole to the sum of the parts. In physics, we, we modify this as scaling constant and Boltzmann's constant. So we put a number in front of that. But otherwise, it's a, it's a ratioless number. And by the way, this applies to, one of the things I studied in college was, uh, was information theory. Information theory, Shannon's theory. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. But, uh, but these ideas apply perfectly to that as well. Uh, so it's not just physics. This is, a, this is a more general definition than that. But anyway, in physics, we're scaled by the Boltzmann's constant. In, uh, a uh, definition of temperature, then, is I take the whole amount of energy in the, in the region and I subtract the, the individual components. In other words, the energy that each part would have just interacting with itself. And that difference, that extra energy, that's the temperature. It's, again, modified by Boltzmann's constant. And it comes from the fact that, that energy relationships, interactions of fields are quadratic in nature. You can never get rid of the quadratic nature of, of, of energy. That's what it is. So you're always going to have this coupling term. That's what this 2AB term is. Everybody, you all know that a squared plus b squared is a squared plus b squared minus two plus 2ab. The 2ab is the coupling term. That's the mutual energy. That's the, that's the, uh, the randomness, if you will. That's, that's, what's, that's what's keeping these things from being, you know, just all isolated billiard balls, okay? That's what's making life in interesting. If we get rid of that, take away all the interaction energy, what we're left with is the zero-point energy. That's the energy of the things left by themselves. And can that be tapped? Yes, it can. And here's how. Uh, I, might, I might be jumping ahead a little bit. I'm so, I'm not going to finish. I can see that. <laughs> uh, energy, anyway, well, let me just say this. Energy is relationship. 200 years ago, there was, uh, there was something called caloric. People believed there was a thing called caloric. And they, they th thought that's what heat was, is this thing that showed up and was caloric. And we all laugh at that and think how silly they were to think that because we know that it's just a measurement of relative translational motion. Today, and for the last 400 years, we have been regarding light as a thing. In other words, here's A, light leaves A, travels through space for you know, a couple billion years, and then it ends up here. That's what it is. That's not what it is. Light is not that. Light is not a thing any more than heat is a thing. It is a measure of relative rotational motion, just like heat is a measure of relative translational motion. Okay, the best book that I can think of is actually written by a mainstream scientist, Richard Feynman. Anybody read the book QED? No? Okay, we got one. It's a great book. Uh, I mean, there's some things about it that I disagree, but he's on the right track. What he said was, imagine light leaving source A, traveling to C and then to B, and then from D and then to B, and then to all these different places, and then they add up all the contributions, and that's what you, that's what you get. And that's basically, that's, that's mathematically correct. Another way to say the same thing is just, just take into account all the influences of everything, take into account all these energy relationships and see what net result you get. And that's light. It's not a thing. It's just something that you get as a result of these interactions. Energy is not a thing. Energy is a relationship between things. So objects have energy by, by re their relationship with other objects, both in position and with motion. So for example, if I have something on top of a mountain, it has more energy because of its relationship with the Earth as potential energy. So I'm saying if something is moving, it's moving with respect to something, so it has energy because of its relationship with that something that it's moving with respect to. Is it making sense? Energy is not a thing. That's really central. Even if I don't get to the rest of the stuff, hopefully we'll get that. Mass, too, is relational. And by the way, it's rotational. Mass has a rotational component. 
And here's some people that have shown that, both in theory and experiment. Uh, hopefully all of you are familiar with Eric Laithwaite and Bruce De Palma, who did some actual physical experiments to show the, re rela the, the relationship of rotation to mass. Uh, this is one of my heroes, Dennis Allen. Probably a lot of you have never heard of him, but he's doing some incredible work right now on the, uh, the actual mathematics of understanding some of these theoretical ideas. Uh, Paramahamsa Tiwari has also been working. He worked closely with Bruce De Palma years ago. He's doing some great work. Uh, this guy here, A.J. Sharma, you've probably never heard of either, uh, but he made an interesting derivation, which, which floored me because I made the same derivation in my work on entropy. I, I realized that, there, that the mass of something not rotating is different than the mass of the thing rotating. So we have to have an, an entropy term to, co to compensate you know, for, for that increase, and I, I call it delta. He came up with the same thing from a totally different perspective. So there's, I like it when I see convergence on things like that. But, uh, so the common E equals MC squared is only looking at translational motion. It's not considering rotation. We need to start including that in there. So mass is magnetic. Bill Alec has uh, did a really, have you seen the, the YouTube video of him dropping two rocks from a building and the one with the magnet falls slower? Seen that? That was actually developed by Boyd Bushman. So is magnetism related to mo rotation? Absolutely. Fundamental particles have magnetic moments. We know that. Why? There's really only one answer. What is a magnetic moment? It's the product of uh, current times the area. In other words, there has to be a current. There has to be a, a circuit. There has to be a charged circuit. That's the only way you can get a magnetic moment. So, duh, particles may, are made of charged circuits. I mean, what else, what else makes sense? So it's, and that's related to rotation. You can't have a circuit without something rotating around in a circle. Magnetism results from the circulation or rotation of matter. By the way, this is, a, this is a, a, another way of expressing Newton's third law. Newton's third law, every action has an opposite reaction. There's one, think about this, friend. That's a billiard ball idea. In other words, I got, I got A and I got B. What about A and then the little, little infinitesimal A and the one behind it and the one behind it and the one behind it and the whole continuum of stuff? I'm going to have to have a continuum of reactions to all of these things and eventually I'm going to have a circuit. So the law of the circuit is really the, the Newton's third law for the continuum. Does that make sense? Not getting a lot of feedback on my question, but <laughs> anyway, hopefully it makes some sense. All right, so why circuits? Let's return to the element of matter. I alluded to this earlier. It's part of a part of a part. Okay, in other words, if matter is ultimately divisible, in other words, there is no final point where we can say, that's it, we can't go any further. That's what Heisenberg wants us to believe. If that's true, we can just keep, in other words, we can break down the part, break down that part. Uh, we, we, we have to, then the motion of my little element has to be pre followed by the motion of another element, which is followed by the motion of another element. And this, this circulation of motion, I'm talking at the fundamental level, if I'm talking about actual matter, this, circula this, this motion of matter then is either going to go on forever or it's going to come back into itself. Those are the only two choices. And so, can it go on forever? No. Each infinitesimal element follows another, and the string of elements don't move on forever if the universe is finite, and I've got a lot of reasons why that's the case. Circuits are fundamental. They are not just a neat little thing. They are fundamental to the very nature of the universe. We've got to get that locked into our brains. Vortex theory is nothing new. I didn't make it up. The Greeks were doing it. Kepler believed in it. Descartes had a whole theory based on vortexes. Leibniz was into this. A lot of people in, that, in the next century, uh, Swedenborg and Boscovic, were big on vortex theories. It's kind of come in and out of style many, many times. Ampere, you know what Ampere said in his most famous paper, which, by the way, has never been translated into English. That's a crime. But he said that he imagines that the fundamental uh, particles are tiny little circuits. That's Ampere. That's what he thought. Kelvin thought so too. Okay, they may have had different ideas about this, but a lot of people have thought this. Uh, Planck, anybody read Planck 1900 paper? It's an awesome paper, you gotta read it. Guess what he calls his little, that this is the paper that started quantum theory. Guess what he called those little particles? Well, I just told you, he called, <laughs> he called them resonators. Now, think about it, what does resonance mean? It means that something is in sync with something, right? In other words, he could have just as well have said circuits, couldn't he have? I mean, it pretty much means the same thing. Maybe, I don't know, that, that's in something with, with a pulse, something with a frequency. Well, how do you get a frequency unless you got something that's circulating? So that, that's Planck's idea. Then along came a guy named Niels Bohr, and uh, he said, uh, he came up with his, his idea of what, what circuits are. 
And uh, he had these little billiard balls that rolling around and at, rolling around the, the, the nucleus. A lot of people do not know this, but two years later, he, Niels Bohr's theory came out in 1913. Two years later, a guy named Parson, Alfred Locke Parson, uh, came up with a, an improvement on, on uh, Bohr's theory. And it was basically take that charge element and smear it around the whole circuit so that each element is replacing another one behind it. Everybody found So it's basically the same idea. Now we've got this ring here. The reason why this is such a significant thing is, is uh, uh, you need to know that charge radiates. Moving charge radiates. Okay, but when you have it in a circuit, what you have is a st you have a, a, a stable pattern. Because each element is, is being replaced by one behind it, the thing looks stationary, and yet everything is moving. So there's no radiation. And par that was Parsons' contribution in 1915. And there's a bunch of people that thought that was a pretty cool idea, including Arthur Compton. Interesting idea. And a bunch of people, it, the idea kind of died out in the whole quantum theory. Niels Bohr took over. And I don't know, just a, it's, a, it's a tragedy in history that that idea didn't take off. But Parson actually influenced a guy named Gilbert Lewis. Gilbert Lewis based his Lewis structures on Parson's ideas. Interesting. Uh, Compton student Bostic came up with some, some vortex ideas, which with his papers are still available. A couple other people, I mentioned Tuari earlier, Bergman and Lucas, of course. Vladimir Ginsburg spoke at this conference in 2004. Uh, Philip Konarev has uh, been doing work on this. Stoyan Sarg, a name that a lot of you probably are not familiar with, uh, done some incredible work building models based on circuit ideas. In the NPA right now, there are probably Dozens of people who are working on physical models of the atom that are all based on circuits, all of them. Uh, they're physical finite models. They obey the laws of electrodynamics. So why do we have quanta? Circuits are finite groups. You cannot have a, an infinitesimal circuit. You cannot have rotation of an element. It has to be, things that have to be rotating as part of a group. Does everybody see this? So it has to be finite. It's comprised of a collection of elements. Rotation is a group phenomena. You understand there has to be something finite to, to even have rotation at all, just like expansion and contraction are groups. Everything is happening relative to the other elements in the group. Okay? That's, translation is not the case. Translation, you can talk about an element of matter translating. That's what makes it challenging, and that's why, and it's three-dimensional. That, that's, these, are the, these are the things that are, that are difficult in physics today. It's just we get, we get our head around this basic idea. We've made some things. We're making some progress. Even though the elements comprising the circuit are continuous, circuits themselves are finite. So at some level, there has to be circuits of matter. And that's what particles are. Particles exist because circuits are primary. And that's my answer to Ernst Mach. So the concept of state, and I know I, I'm just not going to finish because <laughs> that's all there is to it. The concept of state is the idea that interactions are quantized too. Okay, So in other words, particles are quantum. By definition, they're particles. There's only so many. If, if the universe is finite, then there's a fi some finite number of these particles. But their interactions are quantum also. You, you, you have A and B, you're gonna, and, and you're, you can be able to uh, couple them together in only so many ways. In fact, n squared ways, if you've got n particles. So the balance between natural e repulsion and attraction due to motion is called equilibrium. Okay, so equilibrium is possible because there can be a balance between the natural repulsion between like elements and the attraction due to their motion. That's how we get balance. That's how we can have finite structures. That's how we can have equilibria between those structures. And so it, here's the point I, may, I talked to earlier. Instantaneous energy, which is the energy, remember I talked about these expanding and collapsing particles, is not the same as the state energy, which is the energy about which they're oscillating. There is some there is some equilibrium position about which this thing is expanding and contracting. Okay? And it is the equilibrium, the state energy, that we talk about when we talk about the mass of this or the mass of that. We're not talking about the instantaneous energy because that's taken into account all the other energies of its motion with respect to its environment and things like that. The internal energy of the thing by itself is its state energy. Is everybody getting the difference between the instantaneous and the state energies? Does that make some sense? So when we're talking about the mass or the something of a particle, we're talking about this number. That's quantum, and it's fixed. There's a fixed state for, for every configuration. But they can oscillate about those states. So particles expand, contract, translate, rotate continuously about quantum states. And this leads me to something called catastrophe theory, which is the idea that, uh, that states have when we change states, you can think of it as a potential well. Think of a ball rolling between two valleys, and if it rolls over the hill into the next valley, then suddenly it's in this state. 
Am I making sense? So that's, and sometimes those, those uh, continuum can be disc discrete. In other words, we can't, we, if, if we uh, go to one state, and I lost my little guy, where'd he go? Oh, oh here he is, thank you. Uh, okay, I'll just talk about him now. I love this guy, in fact, I think he's on the next screen, so there he is. This is my free energy catastrophe, his name's Harry Popper. And uh, what I want to show you is that the, the, I can expand and contract this thing in a whole continuum of, 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 of instantaneous motions. But how many states does it have? Whoops. Two, right? And by the way, here's another little lesson. Would you stop that? Okay, here we go. Now see how high I've got it? Did I get more energy out than I put in? Did I violate the laws of physics? It's true. But what, uh, what I want to illustrate by this is really important. And, and I, I encourage everybody, thank you, he's really a Dickens, uh, thank you, uh, to, to, to get something like this and show this to your friends. People say, what's free energy all about? This is what I, this is what I show them. Because I tell them, look, I'm not violating the laws of physics. What I'm doing is I'm finding things in nature that like to be like this for whatever reason. There are a few things in nature that want to do this. Anybody remember Tom Bearden saying, don't destroy the dipole? He would say, find something in nature that has a dipole to it and then tap that. In other words, we all know that the, what do we got? Okay, well, I'll just get as far as I get, no problem. Um, I'm only going to get halfway through. <laughs> I'm not going to get to the toroids, but that's okay. Uh, this is important. <laughs> I'm sorry, Marco. Please don't be mad at me. <laughs> Greg, hold on a second. How many of you are finding Greg very interesting? Yeah. Now, All right. now, Greg, you've got some incredibly excellent material here. Um, how much time do you need? Well, uh... <laughs> now, no, if we, if we cut in the break and we push things back... How much okay, time here, could okay, I take? I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> We're going to take the third session in the morning and we'll truncate it a little bit. Oh, and we'll give Greg an extra 20 minutes. How's that sound? Thank you. Did I do? Thank you. As well as all right with you guys? Thank and you. And here's Greg. Okay, I still probably won't finish, but I'll get into the Torrids. Uh, but that's all right. Anyway, what I want to say is if we can find things in nature that like to be like this, then we can tap that resource. Well, there are, uh, well, I didn't finish my illustration. You see, the, we all know that the, the ground is a, is a fixed potential. If we could find another potential that we could just tap into, that, that nature gave us, that we could just plug into, we would have free energy, right? So the question is, where can we find dipoles like that? And I think we know the answers. We know the answer, one of them is water, because water likes to be, for whatever stupid reason, I don't know, I still haven't figured it out, but water likes to be in the dipole state. And I, that's why I get so excited about Brown's gas. I think Brown's, the Chris Ekman's idea of Brown's gas is that it's actually a higher state, uh, a higher energy level of water itself, with, the, with the, 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 two, the two protons moving at opposite ends of the oxygen atom. And uh, normally, for 99.9% you know, .9 of all, all elements, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dipole-free version is the lower energy state. But for whatever reason, water does the, the opposite, so we have the opportunity to do this. Let me do it again just because it's fun. <laughs> anyway, what's another thing? Magnets. Magnets, for whatever reason, ferromagnets and neodymium magnets like to be like this. They like to go into that state where they, you know, for I visualize ferromagnets as being you know, uh, a whole collection of electrons and protons building up this atom, but one of them likes to be in the same magnetic alignment as the next one, for whatever reason. Instead of, nor, nor, you know, uh, destroying it. Oh, you have the reason? Well, most things are, are you know, paramagnetic. They, 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 want to, they want to do the cancellation. For whatever reason, magnets do. That's what we're trying to tap. And a third one is the, the atom itself. I, I alluded earlier to uh, Dr. Lucas and his saying that um, that talking about the, the 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 dipole nature and it's a spherical dipole of the proton on the inside and the uh, the electron shell on the outside. Well, that's a dipole, okay? And that I believe can also be tapped, and I think that's what the PAP engine is about. So there we go. I mean, you know, we can find those things in nature. Now, it would help, I think, if we really had a good physical model of why they do the things that they do. 
And that's my, that's my ambition, hopefully be part of that and encourage people who are working on that, is to figure out the physical model, that why these things have the properties they do. That may help us figure out how to tap them. But that's why those are the things that, that everybody's getting excited about, is because they have that dipole, because they're this, because they want to be here, okay? Anyway, so yeah, get one of those and show them to your friends. Uh, uh, I, I want to, well, I'll just allude to that. This catastrophe theory is it's something called hysteresis. A lot of times in a state, for example, here, I can get to this point, and whether it goes this way or goes that way depends on where, where I came from. You know, that's called hysteresis, and that's what that little envelope, that little thing there, depends on where you come from is going to determine where you are in the state. You have to get more energy to get over the state, and there's this little region in between that's sort of ambiguous. And there's a whole mathematics behind this, and it's called catastrophe theory. This is not catastrophism uh, uh, in the Velikovsky sense. This is a mathematical theory. And, uh, and it, it talks, about the, whoops, talks about the idea of bifurcation. Bifurcation is just a mathematical idea of when fields come together to a point, there's, there's going to be a discrete points in the electromagnetic field, which are either vortexes or, or, or like magnetic field uh, mm, sheaths, where, they, where, they're gonna get, where you're going to go one way or the other way, depending on where you are in the field. That's called a bifurcation. And this is just basically a mathematical theory about that. And you can build different catastrophe machines. They're just things like this that you can d demonstrate yourself. You see them all the time. They're, they're everywhere. Ways to th that, you know, when you have this hysteresis idea. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, here's some more about states. Oh, here's something that's in, uh, <laughs> this is a little toy my kids had. I just want to show you something real quick here. Everybody hears this? Did you hear the little one? Okay. Now here's the point. Was, was the amount of energy that I put into this, was there a continuum of how much I put into it? In other words, I was putting in so much, you know, I, I, I didn't like jump with how much I put into it, but it jumped, okay? In other words, even though my input was a continuum, the output was quantum. Why was it quantum? Because the geometry of this thing determines a certain resonance you know, with how the air is going to flow through it, a standing wave or whatever, and I'm going to get integer multiples of that resonance. It's based on the geometry of the thing I'm twirling. Okay, and it doesn't matter. I'm getting a, a continuum of state uh, of inputs, but a, a, a discrete number of states. Well, what I'm maintaining is that's exactly how fundamental particles are too. What they are, the electron is, and uh, let's take a bugle. You know, you blow into a bugle, you're going to get you're going to get the, 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 the fundamental and you're going to get integer multiples of the fundamental. Well, the same thing with the electron and the proton. That's why we get these changes in state that are discrete. It's not because that they're, they're discrete, there's, there's like there's some magic jump that's going on. It's because there's state. We, we can see it right there. That's why. <laughs> okay? It's the same thing with fundamental particles, and that is another light bulb. Huge light bulb. Hope that goes off for some of you, that that really hits you hard, because that's a big one. All right, now we can talk about the strobe effect. And this is something, again, everybody's seen it. The, the, the problem is we haven't seen it with the right glasses, maybe. Uh, but the strobe effect is always the interaction of frequencies. And by the way, if all these particles are frequencies, then they're interacting, maybe there's some connection. Uh, so you've seen it on the wagon wheel. I wish I could actually get a movie of this. You know, the, the wheel that's turning, and all of a sudden it looks like it's standing still, and then it starts going backwards. Everybody's seen this, right? And then all of a sudden it goes forward. There's a bang old point where it starts going forward. What is it? It's the relationship of the frequency of the frame rate with the actual frequency or rotation of the wheel. There's an interaction of those two. When they get synced up, it looks like it's standing still, right? Because each spoke looks like every other spoke, okay? You see it in the roulette wheel in Las Vegas. That wheel looks, looks, looks like it's going backwards, and then bang, all of a sudden it's going. <laughs> I get excited. Physics is exciting, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but you've seen it, right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Everybody seen Lishiju patterns. You go to the science museum or wherever, you see those. Uh, there was a thing years ago about rods. You know, uh, the, the, they were looking at these things on TV and saying, what are these weird creatures? I mean, uh, they're butterflies or whatever. You know, they're flapping their wings in the same frequency as the frame rate, so they look like they're these weird creatures standing still. Well, you know, that's all it is. It's the, another version of the strobe effect. Uh, and there are lots of science museum toys. Oh, this is... This, I picked this, I went to the science museum last week and picked up these little lights flash on and off at a certain frequency and this thing twirls around at a certain frequency. And what do you get? You get little neat patterns. 
The patterns change because they're changing the frequency of the rate of, uh, that each of these lights are going, turning on and off. But we're getting an a, we're getting a integer relationship between the frequency of the thing spinning and the and the flash rate, and that gives us could give us standing waves, if or it could give us a standing wave with a little precession one way or the other. Is everybody seeing how that goes on? And if this goes if this turns on and off five times while this is spinning around once, I'll have five, and and so on. Okay, that's basically all it is. What I'm saying is that's, that's not just a fun little toy. That's foundational to physics. That's how atoms work. That's how, that's how everything that has frequencies work. And by the way, I don't know if you can, in, the, um, in this little thing, this little program, I don't know who has that. And I, I wanted to get a copy of this. Dan Davidson has, a, I think, a pretty neat picture of a, a vortex in here on page 13. And I, you can't. Well, if you have to find it. But anyway, it, it, it's a vortex, and what we have is we have a vortex going this way, but there's also, as that's going on, it's coming back. So in other words, it's, it's doing this, but it's also doing this. Okay, so it's, it's, it's going in the circle, but it's also going around the circle. Now that's starting to sound like a toy. We're getting, we're getting a, if, we, if we get a, a resonance between, or a lock between this frequency and this frequency, then we can get a lock on the whole thing. Otherwise, we get a little precession or whatever. You see what I'm saying? So, but, Vortexes, by definition, are going to be an interaction of two frequencies, one going around this way and one going around that way. So there we go. There's the strobe, strobe effect, and that's why it's important. If all particles are circuits having inertial frequency, then is the strobe effect fundamental? I think so. I think it's very important. This is a chart I just threw in because I love it, uh, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I, I, uh, I found uh, that the... Uh, the four, the four Maxwell's equations have some really interesting properties. This is uh, Gau the Gauss laws, which are not, which are, are, are static in time. These are the, these are the dynamic equations, and these are the. Um, remember, I, I talked about group motion. I talked about rotation, which is Faraday's law, uh, being a group thing. Also, expansion and collapse. That's that is a group phenomenon. These are these are magnetic ideas. These are the magnetic equations. These are the electric equations. These are the Ampere's law is the, is the law of translation. Remember, that's the one where we're talking about, you know, with, when something is moving, it has to be expanding and contracting. We can do a whole lot of really neat stuff. I, I could actually do about two hours just on this chart. Uh, very cool, but I won't do that. Okay, I'm finally ready to start Torrides. Uh, this, is a, this is a neat, there was a guy uh, 2,000 years ago or more named Apollonius of Rhodes, and he studied these circles. Have you, everybody seen these circles before? Circles like this? No? Seriously? I'll be darned. I thought this was something everybody would seen. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, uh, just basically what he did is he took two points, any two points, and found all the circles that you can make going through those two points. And they can, you can cover the whole plane with these red circles. Then he found circles that are, that are perpendicular or orthogonal to, to those circles at every point, and you get a whole other family of circles that are centered around those. They're not concentric around that center, they kind of expand out, but you can see that they'll also fill the whole plane. So I could specify any point in the plane by, any t by a red circle and a blue circle. See what I'm saying? A guy named Apollonius figured that out a couple thousand years ago. Does that, looks a little bit like this, doesn't it? A little bit like Faraday's lines of force. These are, I call the red circles the E circles and the blue ones the M circles. Okay, the E circles, the electric circles, because those are lines that electric fields tend to follow, and the blue lines are the lines that magnetic fields tend to follow. And we could see that in, in this little construction here, Faraday's lines of force. So those, what we have again, two poles. So polarity, the idea of two poles is pretty important. We all learned, um, we all learned polar coordinates in high school. You can specify a point, you have one point, and then you can specify other points in the plane by the distance from the center and then the, the radius around from the x-axis, all that stuff. I think bipolar coordinates are more important because, because nature gives us a lot of things that come in conjugate pairs. In fact, almost everything physical comes in conjugate pairs. Everything has a circuit nature to it. We need to, to really get serious about the mathematics that help us to describe that, and I think bipolar coordinates are the way to go to really understand it, because for every positive and negative, every emission and absorption, every action and reaction, every explosion and implosion, every out and in, up and down, yang, yin, yang and yin, <laughs> male and female. So bipolar is the way nature works. So this is a little simple thing, I, and unfortunately I had a dynamic thing that I can't show you. I have it on my computer if you're interested. Uh, but this is an arbitrary point in the plane. 
Now, uh, here's the math. I told you there'd be some math. Uh, but it's not too bad, it's really just trigonometry. What I did was I said, let's find the circle that passes through that point and these two points here. That's the E circle on which it resides. And, and that's a well-known thing that if you give three non-collinear points in a plane, then you can find the center and establish a circle. And that circle is centered obviously on the, the Z axis, which at center, at center point H. I call that height the small h. And then what I want to do is find the, the circle that's perpendicular to that at that point that passes through this axis. And that is the radius of the M circle. And this little circle here is sort of a special circle I call the base circle, which connects my two base points, the A and A prime. Everybody follow that? Here's the math of that. Basically, R sub H is the, uh, the radius of this circle. And that, as you can see, here's A. So all I have to do is examine this triangle here, O, A, H. And R sub H would be uh, the, 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 the diameter. A is the, this side here, and H is that side, and I get these two relationships. Then I examine this triangle here that has the length R, side A, and the, and the, uh, the, the, the small r of, the, of this circle, the M circle, and I get these two relationships. Also the, the quadratic relationship here. It's not difficult math, right? Everybody's okay with that? Rho is the distance from origin to my point P, and that's equal to x squared plus z squared, okay? Then I do a little bit of math, and I come up with these relationships. I get a, uh, I get a, 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 a minus and a plus, and all I have to do is add and subtract them, and I get these two equations. I'm going through this quickly, but it, I don't want to bore people who don't like math. But this is, this is basically a couple simple relationships. From that, I can do it. This one takes a little more work. Uh, I, can, I can then use these trigonometric relationships to tell my position P as a function of just two parameters, this uh, angle here, phi, and this angle here, psi. Okay, so there I have phi and psi. This is phi, that's psi, and I can tell you that location of that point in terms of my known parameter A, this circle here, and, and the other two um, angles. That's bipolar coordinates. It's not that difficult, it's just trigonometry, uh, but I wasn't taught this in college, and I should have been taught it in high school. I mean, really, it's not that, it's not that bad. You can spend a little bit of time with it, and, and you can learn it. Uh, there's some nifty formulas. As, uh, I, I don't know how, I, I guess I'm going to gloss over this since we're time. This is, all I do, to get to toroidal coordinates, all I do is I take that map and I sweep it around the z-axis. Okay? So let me go back there quickly, because this is, this is important. What, if I sweep this, the, the, the axis going up and down is the z-axis, and this is the x-axis, and I'm going to take the x-axis and sweep it around the whole thing. So you can see that this thing, which is centered on the z-axis, becomes a sphere. Does everybody see that? But this one, the bigger one, that becomes a toroid. Is everybody seeing that? Okay? And that's, and so then, then the, the, third, the third component then is not, not the y-axis, but the theta-axis which is going to be pointing. So now I can specify all points in a, in a I'm not making this up. Uh, this is something that was derived 100 years ago or more. But what's really interesting is nobody ever went through the math here. To div they just said, here it is. It's like, I, 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 that drives me crazy. I, I want to figure out how to get to it. So I, I derived it. It's not that tough. But it is a little, there are some really fascinating things with this. And it's worth spending a couple hours just studying this to, to really get to know this because you can apply it and learn it. Um, anyway, move on. Uh, come on now. Okay, uh, there's there's so many nifty things about this. Uh, th these are the coordinates. Constant psi gives you a, a fixed coordinate. In other words, uh, let me go back here. Uh, whoops. Okay, this angle right here determines this circle. Okay, so if I have a different angle there, I'm going to have a different circle. Does everybody see that? So if I have a constant psi, that means I have a, a fixed toroid. So psi is the parameter that determines which toroid, you know, if it's thin or thick. Is everybody following that? Okay, how are we doing? Phi, okay, all right. I, I appreciate all the extra time. <laughs> okay, anyway, so my point then is the, uh, where was I at here? Uh, so constant, constant psi gives a fixed torus. Toroid knots come from the ra ratio of the, uh, the theta, which is going, which is I call the toroidal component, how many times I go around the donut, to psi, which is the poloidal component, which means how many times I go around the cross section. And the relationship of those two is going to tell me, you know, how slinky it is, the more slinks I have. And, and I just, we can call that the, if, if, if there is an integer relationship between this and this, 
eventually there's, there's going to be a lock. It's going to, the circuit is going to come back to itself. And so that's what this formula is saying. I get it, that, and that's what, uh, that's what gives me a toroid knot. Uh, if, if m times theta is n times psi, I'm going to get a knot. And then I'm, then I'm down to one parameter. Okay, the only free, see, uh, psi is fixed. The only free parameter is this, this function here. Okay, and everything else is in terms of that. So now I have described a, uh, a toroid knot, or a fixed toroid. Here's some real simple examples. This, these are called Villarceau circles. I had a little video, but I don't think I'm going to take the time to show that. Uh, but basically, if you cut the, 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 the toroid in, in just the right way, you're going to actually get circles, and those circles have the radius that is exactly the same as the radius of the toroid itself, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, come on. There we go. This is one I love. This is called the trefoil knot, and that is a beautiful picture of a trefoil knot. But actually, if you see it, it just, you just follow the path around the, the toroid. You go around twice around the whole thing, three times around the cross section, you're going to get this knot. Let's, let's just follow it here. I go twice around the whole thing, but I go three times around the cross section. Once here, twice here, three times. Everybody see that? Or you can look at it here if you like. You follow the path, it, goes, it gets hidden, comes up here, goes under there, gets hidden, comes up here, comes under there. Do you see that these two are the same? These two are topologically equivalent. In other words, topology is about how the knots get tied. Okay? That's, that's what we're talking about. This is a, a reversal. This is n equals 3 and m equals 2. So I'm going, n, I'm going around here three times, but I'm only going around the cross section twice. This is from my little Mathematica program. I don't know what that's there for, but anyway. It, it, if you, you could actually tie the knots. The bad thing about this is it doesn't show you which one's over and which one's under, but this one, it goes over, under, over, under. So, uh, uh, but anyway, this is how it looks if it, on the face of the donut, but that's the knot. And again, if you were to just tie some rope into a knot like this, it's topologically equivalent to that. And what is, I want to, since time is just about, here's the rodent coil, and I apologize to Marco for not having more time to spend on it, but basically, I'm going around this five times, and I'm going around the cross section 12 times. Um, but I, what I want to get to quickly is this toroid model. This is what I was hoping to show you today, and unfortunately, it didn't get built. I should say it's built, but it isn't working yet. And this is Bob DeHilster, who spent the last year and a half working on this. What's going on here is there's a set of lights, LED lights here, which, could be, which are going to flash on like a Christmas tree. Okay, and they're going to circulate. I wish there were more of them, and I wish there this one wasn't here. He did that for balance purposes. But basically, well, that's what we have. So we have a circulation in the poloidal direction of the lights, but then simultaneously, there's actual motion of the plates. So what you're going to see is a slinky-like motion of that Christmas tree light. And as, if we get, get going a little faster, then there'll be less slinks, as you will, as with, with each rotation. If we get a relationship from this frequency to that frequency, we get a lock. And we could actually make the rodent coil. If we did this thing around five times, uh, excuse me, 12 times, that was going around five times, we'd get a rodent coil. If we did it three times there as we were doing the other, we'd get a trefoil knot. And I would like to build one of these for a museum. I think, I think this would be great that kids could press buttons and say, you know, I want this frequency here and this frequency here and see what it does. If it's a little bit off, you get a procession. So you learn a lot of things from that. Um, if anybody's interested in developing that with me, please talk to me. I, uh, here's some more photographs of how it works. It's, it's rather clever how he did it. Uh, these little points right here are coming in contact with the bottom of the plate. The, the, big, the biggest problem is you can't have wires there. <laughs> so you have to have a, like a brush contact. So this is his contact with the plates. This is the top of the plate, and this is the bottom of the plate. Each of these like, separate areas are coming in contact with different parts of the circuit. That's how he did it. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see it work, but uh, it's close. <laughs> we have a video of it, but I don't think we have time. So I'll just go ahead and, and uh, oh, uh, OK. Well, I wanted to, here's, here's just, now that we talked about multiple rings. In other words, having three or five, all of everything I've talked about so far is just one loop. This is three loops. and. Uh, I know we're all out of time, but uh, I, let me just finish with this last little idea here. Uh, this is three loops locked together, okay? And if I, uh, if, if, well, first of all, let me just point out that this has a handedness to it. A lot of people do not know the difference between clockwise and counterclockwise and, and right and left-handed. Clockwiseness is a two-dimensional concept. You take a clock and you say it's going clockwise, and then you turn the clock over, it's going counterclockwise. Okay, so it depends on how you look at it. Helicity does not do that. This, helicity is about how things go in one, in, in, a, in a rotation versus another rotation. 
Okay, so this thing is going, as I, go, as I progress this way, I'm progressing that way around the circuit. So this has a right-handed helicity. If I turn it over, it still has a right-handed helicity. Everybody seeing that? Here's something else that's important about this. If I just have two of these, if I can finish this one, I'll be done. Um, all I have to do to change the helicity is turn it over. Now it's, now it's right-handed, or left-handed, excuse me. Okay, so the helicity, in other words, I can't lock the helicity with only two rings. I need three, and it's related to the idea that this is a three-dimensional thing. When I put the third one in, it locks it. It is now a locked thing, and that's what's so special about the number three and why I believe that these, uh, these fibers have to be in groups of three. But if I have three of now, it's, and now it's uh, left-handed. If I turn one of them over, I don't get, I don't get it. It's not anything. It's a mess. It, you can take, play with it yourself. Uh, I have to have them all together. It, it remains left-handed forever and ever. Amen. So that's the way it is. We're out of time. Right? Right. I guess we are. So I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, George Volk. Well, I give a royal round of applause. Uh, George will be back out in the hallway in just a couple of moments as he gets...